Hello class, today we want to talk about a period known as the period of Protestant scholasticism. This is not the same as medieval scholasticism, although it is similar in terms of its approach to the theological task, but the theology itself is very different. And uh, Protestant scholasticism takes two forms, a Lutheran form and a Reformed form. So let's back up a little bit and set the stage for this. We, we need to be reminded that Luther was not a systematic theologian. Bondage of the Will was probably his greatest theological work, but he, he never wrote a systematic theologian uh, or systematic theology. Justification by faith alone was his greatest single theological contribution, and this he rooted in his theology of the cross, which was his greatest conceptual contribution. Luther embraced a strongly Augustinian view of sin and grace, as, as we've mentioned before, and he maintained the sacramental efficacy of baptism. He, he believed that baptism was a, was a regenerative event in the life of the individual, that it washed away the stain of original sin, that it uh, affected the new birth. Luther argued for a return to immersion as the mode of baptism uh, in, in uh, one of his major writings. Philip Melanchthon was the systematic theologian of Lutheranism. He wrote a systematic theology called Commonplaces, which if you just Google it, you, you'll find quickly that uh, the Latin term loci communi, uh, communitatis is, uh, is a common expression for any systematic theology of the, of the time period. This was a very, it's like every book that systematic theology says systematic theology in the title. Well, in their day, it said commonplaces. And it was the first Lutheran systematic theology. Melanchthon was more erratic, that is, he was more of a peacemaker in nature than Luther, who was more like a pit bull, and sought grounds for compromise and unity. He tended toward a semi-Pelagianism in his view of free will, and he impacted Lutheran theology after Luther's death in this direction. So uh, this brings us to a discussion of Lutheran orthodoxy. L Lutheran orthodoxy connected with uh, Neo-Aristotelianism, a revival of Aristotelianism, produced a scholastic movement in the Lutheran church. Scholasticism uh, attempted a comprehensive approach to theology. If you, if you look at theology, it can be divided into different areas. It can be divided into Old Testament theology, New Testament theology, biblical theology, historical theology, philosophical theology. And systematic theology seeks to bring all of these together into one cohesive uh, framework. Uh, in Lutheran orthodoxy and, and the scholastic period, revelation was supplemented by reason. Revelation was supplemented by reason. The three solas of Lutheranism were sola gratia, that is grace alone, sola fide, faith alone, and sola scriptura, scripture alone. The three Lutheran sacraments were baptism, which typically occurred in infancy, the Eucharist, uh, which was celebrated weekly, and penance. Uh, this includes a congregational confession uh, conducted in the course of the worship service. There's a broad, general, congregational time of confession, followed by private absolution from the minister and assigned acts of contrition. Scholasticism in all its forms reduced saving faith to intellectual agreement to certain theological propositions and resulted in an arid Christian faith devoid of the life of the Spirit. Now let's talk about Reformed scholasticism for a moment. Theodore Beza, who lived from 1519 to 1605, was Calvin's protege and used a rigid application of logic to develop and refine Calvin's thought into what came to be recognized as Calvinism. Uh, Beza certainly held to the, the uh, Calvinistic concept of what we call limited atonement or particular redemption, although it is less clear and highly debated among scholars whether Calvin himself did so. Uh, 
Francis Turretin was a French Calvinist or a Huguenot who produced a four volume systematic theology that continued to influence Presbyterianism down to the 19th century. It is now available in an English translation. Moise Amarok, who lived from 1596 to 1664, was also a Huguenot who modified the teaching on grace to include a conditional universal atonement alongside the commonly accepted unconditional particular atonement. He was tried more than once for heresy regarding this, but was never convicted. His main proposition was this, God wills all men to be saved on condition that they believe, a condition which they could well fulfill in the abstract, but which in fact, owing to an inherited corruption, they stubbornly reject, so that this universal will for salvation actually saves no one. God also wills in particular to save a certain number of persons and to pass over the others with this grace. The elect will be saved as inevitably as the others will be damned. This is taken from the Shaft Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge under the article Emerald. Now this form of Emeraldianism, as it's called, uh, prevails among many uh, who lean toward Calvinism in the Southern Baptist Convention today. And some say it is reflected as early as the Second London Baptist Confession with its single predestination rather than the double predestination of the Westminster Confession. Another key voice in this time period is Jacob, or rather Jacob, or James Arminius. Arminius lived from 1560 to 1609. He studied under Beza before returning to Holland to assume pastoral duties and teaching responsibilities in the Dutch Reformed Church. His introduction of new ideas produced an entirely new line of Protestant thought, Arminianism. He rejected the strong view of God's sovereignty and sought to make more room for human free will. His early father, followers were known as Remonstrants because of a petition they presented to the Synod of Dort denouncing Calvinism. Arminius' view of grace and free will is surprisingly close to what the Roman Church affirmed in the Council of Trent. The main lines of his thought are, first, free will is restored to all in Christ. It is not a denial of original sin. Arminius is very clear about that. But its effects are mitigated by common sufficient grace. Election to salvation is conditioned on foreseen faith in Christ. General atonement makes possible the salvation of everyone, but guarantees the salvation of no one. Grace uh, offered by the gospel and by the power of the Spirit may be resisted, and salvation once received may be lost by an act of free will. So what you're seeing here is the system of Calvinism and the system of Arminianism both are logically consistent systems within themselves. Arminianism begins with free will and ends with free will. Calvinism begins with human sinfulness and the necessity of divine sovereignty and ends on the note of the perseverance of the saints rooted not in human ability because of human weakness, but rather in the purpose of God. So both systems are logically consistent within themselves. If you try to evaluate one system from the perspective of the other, you will find all kinds of logical inconsistencies, but that's not fair to either system. The system must be evaluated from within its own perspective. The Synod of Dort then uh, convened from November 13th, 1618 to May 9th, 1619. They did not make a, a flippant decision regarding uh, the petition of the Remonstrants. Rather, they took uh, a good six months to debate and consider the claims. But in the end, they rejected the claims of the Remonstrants and affirmed what we know today as the five points of Calvinism. That is, total depravity, that we are all fallen and corrupted and incapable on our own of anything that would earn or merit God's favor or goodwill. Unconditional election that God chooses without regard to the merit or status of the individual who will be saved. Limited atonement or particular redemption. The idea that Christ in going to the cross 
did so with the intent to save those whom the Father had chosen and given him. Irresistible grace or effectual calling, the idea that the Holy Spirit uses the preaching of the gospel to work in the heart of the elect sinner in such a way as to ensure his or her voluntary response to the gospel in repentance and faith and the perseverance of the saints. Uh, we might call this the, the idea of eternal security, that all those who are truly saved will persevere by grace to the end in faith because God uh, sustains and upholds and preserves them. We also want to talk then about the rise of Arminianism. How did Arminianism spread? Well, the first uh, to embrace Arminianism were a few early separatists who became the General Baptists in England. The General Baptists were so called because they embraced general atonement. And so they were called a General Baptist. And they held to an Arminian view of salvation in England. But the big push in Arminianism was not from the General Baptist. It was rather from the Wesleyan wing of the Evangelical Awakening, influenced by John and Charles Wesley uh, and their beginnings of what would eventually become the Methodist Church. And so Wesleyanism is a form of Arminianism, but it's not pure Arminianism. It is its own kind of version of Arminianism, and we'll talk a little bit more about Wesleyanism later when we get to the Evangelical Awakening and the First Great Awakening in America. So what were the effects of Protestant scholasticism? Reformed and Lutheran orthodoxy established uh, by me, was established by means of confessions and synodal decisions. So the, the, the boundaries of orthodoxy were, were established. Outside of Germany and Sweden, Calvinism became the dominant expression of Protestant theology. Uh, Germany and Sweden remained steadfastly Lutheran. Vital religion, that is a religion of the heart, was reduced to theological affirmations as evidence of saving faith. If you agreed to the theological dogmas set forth in the confessions, in the catechism, these kinds of things, then it was assumed that you were saved. In the English-speaking world, scholastic Calvinism, scholastic Calvinism served as a safeguard against doctrinal decline. And we'll talk about that more uh, when we get to English Baptists. And Arminianism spun off from traditional Calvinism. So Arminianism was a spin-off movement from Calvinism, a reaction against it. In our next lecture, we will deal with the English dissenters. And so that concludes our discussion of Protestant scholasticism.